really did anoint the service, and it was really apart from what anybody did or anybody came expecting for. And what I found was that the Spirit was wanting me to get up and get involved and more or less lead the worship and and somewhat kickstart people. <coughs> and um, that's what sometimes we need to do in order to enter into the anointing. You know, I think we're under a false, mistaken sense that if the Holy Spirit is going to come and do something, that He's just going to show up and you're going to somewhat instantly feel like worshiping or getting involved in the, in the service or the flow of the Spirit somewhat involuntarily and apart from your own will. That's a misnomer. You have to set your will to get involved and to enter in. And you have to be sensitive, sensitive enough to know when the Holy Spirit is here and when He starts stirring the waters for you to get involved and jump in. If you're having a relationship, a current relationship with the Comforter, it doesn't really matter what everybody else is doing or where everybody else is at. You can hear from the Lord. And you can be in faith. But as a result of the anointing, I hadn't had anything planned last week. But when the anointing came, he was speaking faith. And so I shared some things on faith out of Hebrews 11. Basically read the first 10 verses and gave you some principles. And this week I was uh, watching biography on A&E. <coughs> and I was watching Billy Graham. They had Billy Graham's biography on A&E. And after it was over, they said, and this is Beacons of Faith Week on a &E. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Beacons of Faith Week. I mean, how many of you know that A&E schedules their programming a year in advance? I mean, they do have things that they have to substitute for various things, and if something goes on in the news, they'll throw in something that relates if they haven't. But for the most part, the schedule of biographies on A&E is, is, is prepared at least six months in advance and probably a year. Most of them do their, their format and their programming a year in advance. I mean, all the churches do. All the churches print up their weekly messages. Most of the churches have their weekly messages printed a year in advance. And Mecca, the headquarters of the denomination, sends them out on a monthly basis. And they get a pack of four. And they go through those. And before the month is over, they get the next month. Well, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, I guess that's what you need. You need to have a program. But... He believes, he hopes for better things for his children than having to get programmed. But I thought it was interesting because do you think the Holy Ghost knew that this was Beacons of Faith Week? Sure he did. Now either, either A&E's programming determined that there would be faith poured out on the earth this week or out on the nation this week or else the Lord planned it ahead so that at a certain time, this would be a word of confirmation and that these biographies might be an encouragement to some of his people. You don't think God thinks that far ahead? He probably does. 
And so I began to mention it to a few people in the house, and a few of you dropped over, and I asked you what you thought about it. Well, speaking of faith week, lights of faith this week on a &E, what do you think about that? Oh, well, I think that's pretty neat. <laughs> and you see, the way most of us are is that we think when we wake up in the morning and we look outside and we see it's raining or snowing, we say, ah, it's snowing in the neighborhood this morning. And then others of us who have a real broad horizon, we say, oh, it's snowing in Billings this morning. And then those that have a worldview say, oh, it's, uh, it's snowing in Montana today. You know what really broadened my perspective of things is when I was in Hawaii in 84 and Hurricane Eva came through. And we heard that it wasn't going to touch the islands, that it was going to go off the coast. And in my peanut mind, I'm thinking of the hurricane, you know, off the coast, and thinking pretty, I'm, we're feeling pretty safe, and we're going to stay right in the house that's on the beach, by the way. Uh, we're in Eva Beach. Hurricane Eva is coming to Eva Beach. <laughs> and so we were, look, we were watching the news. And they showed a schematic. They showed a satellite picture of this hurricane. Do you know how large this hurricane was? Bigger than the whole island chain. I mean, I mean, I don't know. It's like here's Oahu, and about four times the size of my hand. Here's the hurricane. Well. It starts you thinking in different terms. And so I've been talking to a few of you about broadening your mentality. Thinking that when the anointing comes, now it doesn't necessarily follow that if the Lord uh, has me teach on something that's related to this body, I'm not presuming that the Lord is saying the same thing to the body of Christ universal, or to even the body of Christ in Billings. It's possible that he could be saying the same thing that I'm saying in principle in many different areas of the world. But I'm not necessarily saying that this works all the time. But when the anointing comes, when the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes, apart from anything planned, and you change your schedule, and I change my message if I have one plan, because we want to follow with what the anointing is doing, then we've got to realize that we're not the only ones that that message is going to. That probably that's a message that's being poured out by the Holy Ghost, at least on the state, and more at least on the nation, and possibly worldwide. Possibly the Lord has decided to pour out an anointing of faith worldwide for this month, for this week. How I many of you know he does stuff like that? You know the movements of God that have covered the earth were no small thing. When the baptism of the Holy Ghost and tongues, speaking in other tongues, hit Topeka, Kansas, and then hit Azusa Street in California in Los Angeles, it started there, but this was a movement that went worldwide. And they didn't have satellite hookup back then. They didn't have networking the way they do now. They didn't have communications the way they do now. That was a worldwide movement that, that was, that was the, totally the product of the Holy Spirit. Man cannot produce that. And it was the same way with the movement of the Holy Ghost on the laying on of hands. It was the same way of the movement of the faith movement. The shepherding movement that actually preceded the faith movement to bring the church of Jesus Christ back into some semblance of order, defining the pastors as shepherds and defining their responsibilities, <laughs> bringing back an understanding to fivefold ministry to government within the church, delegated spiritual authority, sanctioning of the Holy Ghost, all the different things that I've taught on all these years. And then the faith movement came. And now there's somewhat of a movement going worldwide that's a laughing movement where people are laughing in the spirit. Churches are having Holy Ghost breakdowns. People are rolling in the aisles. 
Now, there's a lot of things that are happening in that that may not necessarily be the Holy Ghost, but there's been a lot of things that have happened in speaking in other tongues, the Pentecostal movement, the Charismatic movement, different faith movement. There's been a lot of things that have happened that happened in the Holy Ghost, but the basic movement is of the Spirit. When people start barking like dogs and roaring like lions, you know, any other time in the century, people would rebuke the spirits off of those people, tie them up, and send them out of the room. So that's not necessarily of the Lord, but the fact is, is that the church of Jesus Christ in this hour, worldwide, not all across the world, but in most of the civilized part of the world, is sick. It's sick with denominationalism from the head to the toe. It's sick with man's order. They reverted back to the law, Galatians, the whole Galatian problem. You want to see where the church is today? Read Galatians. That's where the church is. Having begun in faith, they're now going to be perfect and made complete by following the law, the ordinances of man, which robs them from the move of the Spirit, robs them from the gifts of the Spirit, robs them from the moves and the healings of the Spirit, robs them of the revelation of the Holy Ghost, and robs them. Now, so what does a sick man need? He needs medicine. What is laughter? Read your Bible. It says laughter is as a medicine. that heals the bones, heals the body. The Lord's trying to break down some of these pharisaical pastors and people that are so heavy following the Lord. It's like they got five crosses on their back. So that movement is a healing movement. It's to lighten things up. It's to break the curse of the law. It says, cursed is everyone who reverts back to the doing of the law. That's Galatians. That's New Testament material. <laughs> okay. So last week, the anointing of faith came, and I gave you some things out of Hebrews, and we moved into some principles of faith, and there was a, a spontaneity among us, there was a quickening of the Spirit. And so, seeing beacons of faith week on A&E, and, &E and, and being in fellowship with different ones of you throughout the week, I've been... Wondering what would the Lord, what's, what does the Lord want to do? What is, you know, are, were we to come and just continue in the anointing and, and let him move on everybody and see what he wants to do? Or is there some word of instruction that he would have for us? And as I began to think about it, I began to realize a couple of things. If the Lord is speaking faith to us, if the anointing, last week was to give us faith. And the message, not just last week, but the message since Matende came from Kenya and different ones that have come, Joe and Rachel, the message has been that it's time to move out. It's time to get up and to start walking in some of the things that we've been teaching and fellowshipping and doing in each other's lives, being involved with each other's lives, but to get out and to start being active and start being doers rather than sit, sitting and being listeners and being uh, necessarily just instructed. And so that's been the admonition. And so what came to me as I was thinking about it, the Holy Ghost said to me, Lord, increase our faith. Now that's what the Holy Ghost said. Well, I knew he wasn't asking for his faith to be increased, so, you know, I got the message, gee, where, where, where's that in the world? And I knew immediately that it was his disciples saying to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. So I just turned to it. You want to turn to it? Yes. yes. So, it's in Luke. I'll just give you the account in Luke. Luke 17. This is really, this is really interesting. Before we, as you're turning to it, I want to ask a question. What is it that you think, individually, when you have the answer, you raise your hand. What is it that you personally need to have faith for? In other words, what do you think of all avenues of life, what do you think that you need faith for the most? Okay, faith for liberty. Who else? Boldness. Boldness. Wisdom. Love. 
Okay. Okay. A relationship with God. All right. Pay the bills. Pay the bills. Jeez. Stone it. Okay. What do we say? Out of, out of. How many here have to have faith that God will do what He said? <laughs> well, you're being honest. That's too bad. <laughs> if there's one thing you shouldn't have to have faith for is that God will do his part. He'll do his part. Just take my word for it. You don't even have to have faith for it. He'll do it. <laughs> Whoa! You been reading your Bible? <laughs> to have faith to forgive people who offend you. Now, y'all listen to this because I know everybody here is going to agree. If you think about it, you don't really need to have faith that God will do what he said he'll do. You don't really need to have faith that what this word says will happen. What you need to have faith for is people. Who are the biggest problems in life, folks? It's people. It's relationships. It's your husband. That's what you've got to have faith for is that this guy will do the right thing. By you, right? I mean, let's face it. Well, all your wives are so fearful that your husbands won't do the right thing. So some of you tie them up, keep them home, throw them in the closet. When she said, I've delivered my husband's headship back to him, I had a picture of his head on a platter. Here's your head, darling. You can have your head back. That's what most wives do. They deliver their, their husband's heads. When they, when they give them headship back, they give them the head that they kept in the closet. I think if everybody here is really, really thinking, you're going to say, really where you need faith is you need faith to have, you need to have faith for people in relationships who won't do the right thing, who you have to live with. Yeah, family. Yeah. Well, let's see the context. Jesus' disciples. Now, I defy you in the word to find where they asked him when the lunatic, they couldn't deliver the lunatic. When they couldn't deliver the lunatic, they didn't say, Lord, give us faith so we can do this. They said, why could not we deliver him? They didn't even ask for faith. The only time they asked for faith was when he said this. He says, and I'll just read Luke 17, verse 1. Then said he unto his disciples, You know, it's impossible, but, but that offenses are going to come. But woe unto him through whom they come. For it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So take heed to yourselves that if your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he trespasses against you seven times in one day, and seven times he turns again to you saying, sorry, forgive me, you shall forgive him. Now these guys are paying attention. Do you know what Jesus just said? He said, if you have faith, he said, what you need to do is you need to forgive your brother. And he says, if he trespasses against you, go rebuke him. Go talk to him. Say, you, you hurt me. You did this. You did that. And if he repents, forgive him. But if he can do this seven times in a day, you still have to forgive him. The first response was, Lord, increase my faith. <laughs> I mean, I use the analogy like the guy walks up to me and slaps me. Every time he sees me, he slaps me. And he says, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. And i got to forgive the guy. And, you know, if I'm carnal, I'll slap me back and say, oh, forgive me too. <laughs> but that's not the message. See, the message is that if he offends you, you forgive him. You're in a bar, 
So they say, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, well, if you have faith, even as a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root, be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. How many of you think that when they got some free time, these disciples were out <laughs> in different trees? I, I'll bet you they were. I would have been. I would have said, look around the land. In the name of Jesus, be plucked up. <laughs> say to him by and by when he comes from the field go sit down and eat but will not you say to him make ready wherewith I may dine gird yourself serve me then when I have eaten and drank afterwards you shall eat and drink does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him I don't think so so likewise when you shall have done all the things which are commanded you you need to admit that you're still unprofitable servants because you've only done that which is commanded. Do you know there's no reward for obeying the commands of God? Hello. There's no rewards for obeying the commands of God. Do you know why? Because a command has no alternative. Do you know where your reward comes? <laughs> it's when you voluntarily refer to the Spirit and say, I'm here, I'm ready to go to work. What do you have for me to do? That's where the reward system of God clicks in. Anybody can obey a command, even if he disagrees with it, and in his heart hates the one who gave it. How many here have ever obeyed something that they disagreed with? They hated the guy who gave it, but they did it anyway. Right. Hope you're not looking at me. But that's the truth. So, faith, what's Jesus saying? He's saying you need to have faith in relationships. And so, now, I'd like you to turn to Matthew 24. Something came to me. There's a, there's a place in Matthew 24 that has always concerned me personally. Because, to a measure, I know me. And there's some things that go on in the world that really pushes my buttons. And I know my own... I, I can't say I know the measure of love which God has given me or the measure of love that I need. I, I don't know... I know this, I know that I need more love, I need more patience, I need more grace, I need more of these things, okay? But this one scripture has always concerned me. And I also got to thinking, I started thinking, and if you guys will meditate on, on what the Spirit says to you, you'll start getting spin-offs by the Holy Ghost, and He'll start speaking to you like He does me. <coughs> So I started thinking, okay, relationships really are the acid test of love and faith. Relationships are the test for love and faith. Relationships are the test and the proof of one's love and faith. No, I'm not deaf and I'm not, I, I'm not forgetting that I said that three times before. I'm saying it again. I'm saying that relationships are the test and the proof of one's love and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think somebody that operates in the gift of healing has great faith, you're mistaken. I've eaten dinner with Benny Hinn. I've been on TV with him. I've ministered with him. I wouldn't say Benny Hinn had much more faith than many of you here. Honestly, I'm telling He's he, he. I wouldn't say he's super gifted in faith. Do you know what his gift is? Miracles and healing. That's what his gift is. That's what the gift of the Holy Ghost in him is. You don't need a whole lot of faith for. There's some things I don't need a whole lot of faith for. The areas of my gifting, I don't need a whole lot of faith for. 
I can go into any church at any time throughout the service, and I can in about three minutes know what the Spirit's saying to that church. You know why? Because I have a prophetic gifting in my life. It has nothing to do with me. It's like I can go into a church, pick up the phone, and in about three minutes I know what the Lord's saying to that church. It's a great gift because I've traveled all over the country and I just go into a church, I don't prepare anything, I get up to the pulpit and I start speaking and everybody starts laughing. Well, initially in the working of the gift, the operating of the gift, I didn't know why people were laughing. I was checking myself out, am I buttoned up right, you know, is everything all right here, you know? But they're laughing because what I'm speaking to them about is exactly where they're at. And most of the time I was giving the pastor's last sermon that he gave last week. Of course, you think, oh, the Holy Ghost missed it. <laughs> He's a week off. I mean, he gave you last week's message, Gene. No, most of them didn't get it. Most of them didn't get last week's message, so the Lord sent me to give it again. I went to one uh, church in South Carolina where I just went as a guest, and I sat down, and when they, entered, when they told the leadership that I was there, the guy sent a couple deacons over to me and asked me if I'd share, if I'd... Just take, I never met these people. So I got up, and as God is my witness, this happened many times, but I got up, and I decided this, I felt like I needed to share out of Second Peter about the fruit of the Spirit. And if these things be in you and abound, they will make you so you need to be blind or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, etc. And so an entrance will be opened to you into the everlasting gospel or everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And whoever has these things in him, the fruit of the Spirit, will never fall. If you make your calling and election sure, you'll never fall. So I went through that. Well, the guy starts laughing. The pastor's laughing. I'm thinking, well, I touched his button. He got up, stopped me, interrupted me, said, you people need to know this man sent from God because he's just read word for word, scripture for scripture, exactly what I was going to give you tonight. He sat back down. He said, go ahead. <laughs> but I mean, that's how the gift of God works in me. Now, I don't need to have a whole lot of faith for that. I really don't. It just happens. But what you do need to have faith for is relationships. You do need to have faith for relationships and in relationships. You know why? Because therein is the mystery of the marriage of Christ found. Relationships is where the mystery of Christ is found. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that you have been grafted into what? The natural vine. Grafted into the natural vine. That's the mystery. So let me read this. So the scripture that has really concerned me and been a concern to me for a long time is Matthew 24, 12. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Has anybody else worried about this scripture? Has anybody else thought about this and worried about it? It's bothered me. You know why? Because I have to say from time to time, I've seen my love my willingness to get involved in people's lives, my willingness to expose myself again, make myself vulnerable to non-believers and believers alike, my willingness to, to get involved, I found myself kind of withdrawing and backing up because, you know, I got slapped around so many times I was wondering, I think I'll just take this year off. Anybody ever felt like that? You know, and the world, of course, says, you know, what, screw me once, shame on you, screw me twice, shame on me. And so, two times and you're out. And that's usually the way people are. Oh, I've been hurt too many times. How many times have you been hurt? Twice. <laughs> kind of shallow there. But let's back up a little bit. This is very 
important because if you really want your faith, if you want this faith to work, he's going to show you tonight the root, the foundation of where this faith was meant to work. Okay, you were given the Holy Spirit for what reason? To become holy. That's exactly right. You were given faith for one reason. To become godly. You are given faith so that you would appropriate the character of Christ. Faith was to believe in who he is, what he has done, his father's testimony about him. And you were given faith so that you could believe that you could be transformed from the carnal man and woman that you are to a godly man and woman like Christ. How many of you know that? That's what faith is for. <laughs> Now, you can use your faith for cars and houses and children and wives and husbands and, you know, a whole bunch of things. We do use our faith for that, don't we? But the foundation of faith has to do with godliness. It doesn't have to do with materialism. Do you know even the Hindus teach faith for holiness? Buddhists, Buddhists teach faith for holiness. The Muslims... Teach faith for holiness. Do you know that only the Christians in America teach faith for materialism? Oh. Isn't that sad? <laughs> you say, well, who'd want to shave his head and walk around in your robe the rest of your life with a tambourine and become a Buddhist? Well, they look at us and say, who'd want to keep your hair and have your clothes and your riches and end up in hell, separated from God because of your materialism. And there's a balance in it. Christ was involved, but he did he did wear a robe. <laughs> he did he didn't own a house, I don't think, and he and he didn't own a donkey. He wasn't in materialism, but he had everything he needed. He used this world's goods for the gospel. And for the proclamation of the gospel. And because this world's goods are necessary for people. But when the goods become the focal point. See then the message is watered down and it has no more power. The power of the gospel. The power of the word. The power of his lifestyle. The power of his name is to become holy. To become godly. Not like Pope Paul. Not like Muhammad. Not like anybody who professes holiness through physical means. But being holy means to be sanctified, set apart in your heart unto Jesus. Whereas if he wants you to have a limousine business, you'll have a limousine business, but your limousine business won't be the, the focal point of your faith. The limousine business will serve your faith, which is for the sake of giving a testimony. And you shall go into all the world and be my witnesses. And witnesses translates martyr. You can smile. <laughs> Y'all want to be witnesses. I won't be a witness, Lord. I, I want a witness for you. And you, you say what now? You say what's that mean? What? <laughs> Well, maybe I'll be a witness, I'm sure, someday, Lord. I just need a little more education. It's like, I didn't enroll for this. I didn't enlist for this. I know, honey, your spirit's been full on me for five minutes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give it. Speak up. Speak up. This is in relationship to Luke. You, uh, cameraman, wake up. Says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Deliver those who are drawn away to death and those who totter to the slaughter. Hold them back from their doom. If you profess ignorance and say, Behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs and ponders the heart perceive and consider it? And he who guards your life, does he not know it? And shall he not render to you and every man according to his works? 
My son, eat honey because it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. So shall you know skillful and godly wisdom to be thus to your life. If you find it, then shall there be a future and a reward, and your hope and expectation shall not be cut off. Good. Good. That is Proverbs 24, that I started with. And it was not a scripture. It was a number of scriptures. It's okay. They're related to each other. I know, they're all related. It's all good. Now get a hold of this. I want to go up just a couple of scriptures. Let's look at, I'm in Matthew 24, and let's look at verse 9. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. <laughs> then shall many be offended and betray one another and shall hate one another. That word hate translates to murder. So you read that to say, and many shall be offended, they shall betray one another, and they shall murder one another. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Now, he threw this in between the two that really are related. Verse 10 and 12 are related because it talks about being offended, betraying one another, murdering one another, and because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Have we seen this happen just in the last 10 years? There was no such thing as a drive-by shooting 10 years ago. There was drive-by massacres in, in the 30s during Prohibition. But you know, there's very few innocent people were killed in those days. Because they weren't out to kill innocent people. They were out, it was a, a you know, organized crime thing. But the love of many has waxed cold. I was watching something on, on the uh, Christian Network today before coming that um, this off-duty policeman, this woman, young woman, was getting out of her car and these guys pulled up behind her to, to steal her car. She wasn't even in uniform. And she stepped out of her car and the guy that uh, was going to steal her car, pulled out a gun and just shot her, just blew her away. I mean, two men, they could have, I mean, it's just a little thing anyway. They could have just said, out of here, give me the keys, pull the gun on her, and drove off with the car. The guy just shot her. No reason, just shot her. Shot her through the stomach and shot her through the heart. Bullet went through her heart. It was a miraculous thing because they got her into the hospital they had to open her up without any anesthesiology or anything because she was dying. They opened her up and had to get in there and massage her heart with, by their hands for 45 minutes. She died. She was dead. So they brought the family in. The family, in the meantime, had been calling all their Christian friends and all the pastor. About 40 people showed up in this hospital room. They gathered in a circle around her and God resurrected her. Ooh. Wow. And this surgeon, there was two surgeons working on her, and the surgeon, she was dead for like 45 minutes. They were massaging her heart. He said, with tears in his eyes, he said, there were nothing but atheists in that room when she got there, and there were not one atheist when she left. <laughs> yes, and he said, had not the God of all flesh intervened, this girl was dead and she would have remained dead. And this guy was teared up. He wasn't even a Christian, wasn't even a believer. He said, I have seen the closest thing to a miracle that I've ever seen in my life. He said, I've been in this 30 some years. He was in Vietnam, the whole thing. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Not only did she live, but she was without any brain damage, without any motor damage. She's a cop now again. <laughs> I, mean, she, I don't know if she got the message, but she's, she's, she's a cop. She's a cop today. Just a little Chinese thing, a little Oriental girl. Remember what she said when she said uh, uh, that through all this, she was glad that it, it, it touched all the other people. Right. She said, not only am I thankful that the Lord did this for me and he worked on my behalf, but she said he touched so many people because of me. The point here is that the love of many shall wax cold. We're seeing children blown away. We're seeing toddlers blown away. God by shootings. Teenagers.
Kids jump and roll, blown away. No thought, no. I saw a video where a kid was in a 7-Eleven store just playing a, a, a game, just playing a little uh, video game. A guy came in to rob the store, and on his way out, he just shot this kid. Just shot him. Unbelievable. The love of me to wax cold. This scripture has bothered me. Because I still know that in here lives a carnal man too. And I haven't wanted my love to wax cold. So you know what the Lord showed me? He showed me how to keep my love from waxing cold. Do you want to know? Yes. yes. Verse 10, many will be offended, betray one another, murder one another. And because iniquity shall abound, lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be delivered. That word saved is delivered. Now I want to go back to verse 11, because he threw in something here that seems to be out of place. If you know how to read contextually the word of God, this is out of place. But it's not out of place because it's very important in here. And many false preachers, prophets, testifiers, witnesses, many false prophets. What is one of the definition of prophecy? It's the testimony of Jesus Christ, isn't it, out of Revelation. So there'll be many false witnesses of Jesus that will come in the last days and deceive many. Do you know how they'll be deceived? They'll justify people in their waxing cold in their love. <clears throat> They'll justify you to be secluded and withdrawn. They'll justify you because the days are wicked. I don't believe the Lord's going to justify any of his children for being fearful and withdrawn in the last days. I don't believe that. That's right. So you and I got to figure out how are we going to get to a place where we can overcome Fear has been on your back since you've known, Chris. Oh, my God, Bonnie, how are you going to overcome fear? You ain't got overcome it yet. You're 50 years old. My goodness, you got to live another 50 years to overcome it? I hope not. I don't want to see you at 100. <laughs> you don't need to be here at 100. Obvious, there is a way to overcome. The key is in what Jesus said to his disciples <coughs> about Many offenses will come, but woe to him to whom the offense comes. But your responsibility, you are required as my witnesses, Jesus says, to not only forgive outwardly, but not carry an offense inwardly. Now, you know how you do that? By rebuking your brother. <coughs> The way that you keep your heart clear from offenses and being critical and unforgiving is by speaking to those that offend you, but not speaking to them in the same measure and rule that they have spoken to you. Speak to them that they have hurt you. Speak to them. Now, I'm going to give you another scripture. Now, you read that in Luke 17, and that's one scripture. Take heed to yourselves if your bro if brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. Isn't it interesting? Jesus says rebuke him. He didn't say, oh, just turn the other cheek, say, oh, God bless you. He said, rebuke him. He said, talk to him about it, get into him about it. Let him know what he's done to you. Now, if you can't do it in a good spirit, do it anyway. You can repent for two things then, yeah. but do it. And then keep going back till you get it right. But let's turn to Leviticus 19, and I want to read this in context. Leviticus 19. And I'm just going to start reading for the sake of time. I'm going to read Leviticus 19, 15 through 18. 15 through 18. This is in context with keeping your heart free from offense. This is the how-to. How do I keep my heart free from offense? Because if I don't keep my heart free from offense, what's going to happen? The love in me is going to wax cold. Yes. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. Offenses is love and faith's greatest enemy. Offenses are love and faith's greatest enemy. Now, I've got a progression here. I'll give you a little later, but I'll just read this. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. 
You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor shall you honor the person of the mighty. Boy, I'm telling you what. The church could read this and take a few notes. How many of you have ever gone to a conference and had about the first third of the whole auditorium roped off? Anybody have done that? You shall not respect the person of the poor nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go up and down as a tail bear among your people. You shall not, you shall stand against the blood of your neighbor, neither shall you stand against the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Verse 17 is the key verse. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Now, this is an awesome scripture because he's going to tell you right away how you cannot hate your brother in your heart. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor, your brother, and not suffer sin upon him. This is almost word for word what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. What if he doesn't repent? Well, you have, there's two types of forgiveness, isn't there? There's a forgiveness, uh, a outward forgiveness to re relieve or resolve people from any responsibility. And there's an inward, there's a subjective forgiveness that keeps me free from offenses. I say if your brother doesn't repent, you don't forgive him. You forgive him subjectively, but not objectively. You forgive him so that you don't carry an offense. You forgive him, and here's what you say. Let's say my brother comes, and um, let's say he's disrespectful to my wife. And I walk up and I say, brother, you know, you, you cannot speak to my wife that way. And you need to, to ask her forgiveness, and you need to ask my forgiveness. It, it offends me that you speak to my wife the way you do. You have no respect. And he says, I'm not asking your wife to forgive me. She deserved it, and that's just the way it is. And we talk, and he's just not going to forgive her. He's not going to repent. Here's what I would say to him. I would say, Outside. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there because some of you were thinking that. <laughs> I would say to this man, I would say, you know, brother, I just want you to know that I'm not going to hold this against you in my heart. It's, it's, I can forgive you for this in my heart because I know that you don't know what you're doing. I know that you don't know how you're, how you're hurting yourself. So I, I can forgive you in my heart, but I need to tell you that you're not forgiven for what you do by God until you repent. Does everybody understand that? Is that putting a, like a whammy on the guy, or is that like putting a curse on the guy, or is, that, is there anything wrong with that? No, it's the way that it is. Now I want to go back to this scripture. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke him. And not suffer sin upon him. You shall not avenge nor bear a grudge against him. But you shall love him as yourself. You shall love him as yourself. Some people have had a hard time forgiving themselves for things that they've done. Do you know the people that have a hard time forgiving themselves for what they have done? Are the self-righteous? Sorry. I mean, maybe you thought I was going to give you some slack. Oh, that's all right. We'll pray for you after the service. The fact is, is that if you understand who you are and who God is, you shouldn't have a hard time forgiving yourself. Instead of having a hard time forgiving yourself, you ought to just be thankful. Because when you can't forgive yourself, 
You're not knowing who he is. You don't have to forgive yourself. He already has. You just need to agree with what he's done. And you need to be free as he is free in forgiving you. And the reason you can't be free in forgiving you is because your righteousness is in your works. Your righteousness is in yourself. Now, driving down the street, a little kid runs out in the street, you run him over and kill him. The self-righteous, the one who is in absolute control of their life will blame themselves till they go to the grave. You can pray over these people. You can show them what happened. You can, God can give them a vision from heaven. They won't, they won't forgive themselves because they are in control of their life. The one who understands the grace and mercy and power of God can forgive himself and move on. Even if he was driving too fast and driving reckless, he can forgive himself. With the blood of Jesus Christ and the mercy of God, he can forgive himself. He can, even if he goes to the electric chair, he can go to the electric chair free of guilt and the condemnation.